Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 65, which will be all about fungal reproduction. In pretty much every episode in the series uh, before this, I've mentioned aspects of fungal physiology or pathology that involve reproduction. In each instance that I've mentioned fungal reproduction, I've only touched briefly on the subject, but I've, I've never really gotten into too much detail. Well, if you had always wanted to hear more about that particular aspect of fungal biology, then today is your day, because this episode is all about the ways that fungi replicate. There are a lot of ways that fungi replicate. As a kingdom, the fungi have a huge range of reproductive tactics relative to animals and plants. The fungi can reproduce asexually through fragmentation, the deliberate production of new buds, or with spores. And they can reproduce sexually, either with gametes, or through anastomosis and plasmogamy. Alright, now I want to introduce the weird world of fungal reproduction with a group known as the fungi imperfecti, or the deuteromycota. Although this group doesn't have this classification anymore, it's considered an outdated classification. These fungi were once classified taxonomically as imperfect fungi, because they don't appear to have a complete reproductive cycle relative to other fungi. The imperfect fungi have only ever been seen to reproduce asexually, through the use of spores. It seems as if they're largely stuck in what's called the anamorphic stage, which is a stage in the fungal life cycle where they reproduce vegetatively, asexually, as part of their growth through this portion of the life cycle. They never really seem to reach the teleomorph stage of the life cycle, where the fungi typically produces a fruiting body and reproduces sexually. You would recognize this as a mushroom, for example. But for the deuteromycota, this never seems to happen. They never seem to enter this teleomorph life stage. Now, in contrast to the imperfect fungi, there are the so-called perfect fungi, and all that this means is that they faithfully go through the entire life cycle, with an anamorphic stage characterized by vegetative growth and asexual reproduction, and a teleomorphic stage characterized by a fruiting body and sexual reproduction. I'll go into more detail on the reproductive cycle in a few minutes. Because the methods that fungi use to reproduce are so varied, and they occur during various stages in the fungal life cycle, there's going to be a lot of information for me to cover today. So I'll be exploring each method of reproduction in as much detail as I can, with consideration of time constraints. It seems appropriate, then, to start at the simplest, most basic method for fungal reproduction, which is an asexual process called fragmentation. This is the simplest method because it involves the mycelia just physically breaking apart to form two separate chunks of mycelia. What's pretty interesting is that fungi can survive fragmentation caused by external physical damage, and they can also engage in a deliberate kind of fragmentation with their own chemical processes. So the mechanical damage part is pretty straightforward. You have a mold, or a yeast colony, or some kind of mycelia just out there growing on a rock or a tree. And if an animal comes by, it might break the fungus. Maybe a moose rubs its shoulder against the tree and squishes the fungus into a few pieces. Maybe a fungi-eating predator comes and bites into it, ripping up the main mycelia and throwing little bits of it around. In either case, all of these little chunks of mycelia are still composed of living hyphae. If they land somewhere wet, near something that they can eat for nutrients, the little fragment will survive and live on as a clone of its so-called parent. In contrast, some fungi have qualities that allow them to control, or actively or passively engage, in a process of fragmentation. Lichens are a great example of this. In earlier episodes, I've talked about lichen a little bit, and if you've just happened to listen to those episodes and you heard me talk about lichen, then you should know that lichen is a symbiote of multiple fungi, and a species of algae or uh, some kind of cyanobacteria. The most typical way for a lichen to fragment and reproduce asexually 
is by simply drawing out and experiencing some kind of mechanical disturbance, like the wind, or a falling rock, or the wayward hoof of a grazing mammal. You get the idea. However, lichens sometimes create specialized structures intended specifically for reproduction by fragmentation. These are called isidia, and the isidia are long, thin, branching projections that come out of the thallus, or the, the body of the lichen. The isidia are quick to dry out and break off, and that's their intended purpose. The isidia possesses hyphae from both fungal symbiotes and the photobionts, the, the photosynthetic algae or the cyanobacteria, you know, that's inside of the isidia as well. Now, even more specialized are the structures called soralia. Now, these are like baskets, holding a few globular structures called soridia. These soridia are bundles of algae cells, each of them wrapped and tied together in hyphae. The soralia exposes these soridia to the wind, and they get blown away, where they land somewhere and then grow into new mycelial clones. So, just to recap, the isidia are like these long branches packed with everything that the fungi needs to reproduce. They dry out, they break off, they fly away in the wind and land somewhere, and they start growing again. Now, the soralia, they produce these little bundles called soridia. And these are like if the fungi has been compressed and wrapped up into this nice, tight little package. That little package will just bounce away or blow away on the wind, and then unfold and become a new fungus. Now, single-celled fungi, called yeasts, are known to reproduce asexually through a process called budding. The yeast cell typically has a smooth, spheroid shape, and when it begins to bud, a little bubble will begin to grow out of its side. This small bubble is the beginning of the daughter cell, and it's going to inflate like a balloon being slowly filled with water. During this budding process, during this growth, the parent cell's nucleus will duplicate and be positioned within the daughter cell, and it will also duplicate any necessary organelles and ribosomes. Now, once the budding cell has gone through enough of its growing process, it will detach from the parent's yeast cell and then live the rest of its life independently. An interesting detail here is that the daughter cell created through this budding process is generally smaller than the parent cell. They're not the same size. Now, this isn't the case when yeasts divide by binary fission, which is another method that some yeasts use for asexual reproduction. Binary fission is a process by which a single-celled organism can reproduce to create two identical daughter cells. And it's not just limited to fungi. In fact, uh, in all actuality, relatively few fungi actually reproduce this way. Binary fission is largely a technique that's used by bacteria, and by the mitochondria within a eukaryotic cell. Now, during this process of binary fission, the fungal cell will begin to copy its DNA, and then its organelles and everything else that it needs. And while all of this is happening, the cell will grow in size, and its nutrient demands are relatively high. The cytoplasm will bulge outwards, until the cell is, eventually, nearly twice its original size. A cleft will appear in the middle of the membrane, which cuts through the cellular mass until it reaches the membrane on the other side. At this point, the cleft that's running through the cell will meet the membrane on the other side, and the cytoplasm is pinched off as the two daughter cells split apart. Now, asexual reproduction in larger multicellular fungi is, naturally, a little more complicated. This kind of regular asexual reproduction occurs during the vegetative anamorphic growth phase. In this phase, the fungi will grow like a mold. The hyphae will creep around the substrate, looking for detritus to cling to and saprophytically digest. In general, the mycelia will spread out as this amorphous blob. And in the first episode of the series, I discussed the structure and the nature of the hyphae. I believe I also made some reference to the specialized growth structures that branch out from the hyphae to serve some particular purpose. 
Now, at the time, in that earlier episode, I didn't go into too much detail, because these structures that branch out from the hyphae, these conidiophores, are reproductive in nature, so I wanted to save that subject for today. Many of these conidiophores are structures that produce and release spores, which then float away to become a new clone mycelia. Now, before I can get into that, I have to explain some of the evolutionary background so that you can get the full picture. There is a long evolutionary lineage behind the fungal kingdom, but most of these earlier species that have existed throughout their natural history have gone extinct. And most species of fungi that currently exist are in a group called the dicaria, which are fungi whose cells and spores have no flagella. They can use the wind to move their spores around, and they don't necessarily need a flagella to help them swim through the water. And this has helped these fungi adapt to harsher, drier environments. This subkingdom, Dicaria, has two major divisions, the Ascomycota and the Basidiomycota, each of them so named because of the shape of their spore-producing reproductive structures. In both the Ascomycota and the Basidiomycota, the fungi predominantly use asexual reproduction to perpetuate their lineages. The hyphae will split and branch, and these branching hyphae will develop a specialized tip. It makes a hyphae fiber uh, a few cells long, and then the cell at the very tip of this structure will divide, but it doesn't continue to extend in length. Instead, the newest cells will all bunch up at the tip, all of them poking forward like hairs on a round paintbrush or a broom. All of these cells will then divide lengthwise again, creating another layer of smaller cells, and then these will divide again, so this is like the hairs on the paintbrush kind of extending or growing a little bit. To put it another way, the first division was kind of like your arm splitting into fingers, and this second division is kind of like if your fingertips split into even smaller fingers. The purpose behind this is to amplify the number of spores that the conidiophore can produce. So imagine that your arm and your hand is like a conidiophore. Your arm is a chain of single cells, and your fingers are long, thin cells that are all bundled up at the end of the chain. Now, out of your fingertips, spores would be produced and released. If you have five fingers, then logically you can produce five spores at a time. But what if each of your fingertips was split into five smaller fingers, and each of these could also produce spores at their tips? Well, now you could produce 25 spores at a time on each arm. As you can see, this is an exponential increase in spore production. And this is basically how the fungal conidiophores work, to produce spores for asexual reproduction. There's a wide range of ways that the fungal cells produce and release these spores, and as I go through and describe them, remember that these are single cells splitting off from the tip of a long, narrow cell, which is itself one among many branching out of the end of the conidiophore. Alright, so there are several methods that the fungi use called blastic methods. And this means that the fungi uses a precursor cell to produce the spores. One such method is called a blastic analytic growth pattern, where a spore forms one at a time and then detaches, leaving behind a ring-shaped scar on the parent cell. Every subsequent spore that's produced by the membrane extending out from the same spot will produce rings of scars within scars, as more and more spores are produced and released. This is kind of like the rings in a tree. You know how you can count the rings in a tree to estimate its age? Well, in a somewhat analogous sense, you could theoretically count the rings of scar tissue on the, on the conidiophore cell to get a, a rough estimate of how many spores it's produced. Then there's another method called the blastic phyolytic method, and this is a little more focused. Instead of just budding off of the end of the conidiophore, these spores will pass through a tubular cell called a phyllide. This phyllide cell is like the barrel of a gun, and the spore is the bullet. In yet another method, called synchronous blastic spore formation, 
multiple spores will grow simultaneously from a single point at the tip of the conidiophore. Their growth is generally synchronized, and they will bud off as a group. So if the blastic phyolytic method is kind of like a rifle, where you got one spore being shot through the barrel at a time, this synchronous blastic spore formation is kind of like a shotgun blast, where with each pull of the trigger, you have all of these little pellets, all of these little spores, all blasting out all at once. Then we have the blastic acropodal and blastic sympodial growth forms, which both involve a continual budding of new spores in a way that produces a literal chain of spores. In acropodal spore formation, the spores will keep forming out on the tip of the conidia, so that the youngest spore is the one farthest out. You'll have the end of the conidia, and it'll produce a spore, and then on the end of that spore, a new spore will grow, and on the end of that one, a new spore, and so on and so forth, until you have this chain of spores, and then the chain is either broken off all at once, or broken off in pieces. In sympodial spores, the direction of growth is reversed. So the first spore is formed, and then the second spore forms between the first one and the tip of the conidiophore. And this will continue, making a chain of spores where the oldest spore is the one farthest out on the chain. Now there's yet another method, called blastic retrogressive formation. And in this process, the spores are born when a wall is created shortly before the tip of the conidiophore. So you have a conidiophore, and then a wall is created near the tip, and everything beyond that wall will break off to become the spore. This will happen repeatedly, which will shorten the total length of the conidiophore. So, in other words, in this blastic retrogressive formation, the spores form as little bits that break off of the tip of the conidiophore. And so, in this way, the whole conidiophore kind of dissolves down into spores. Alright, now I already went through like five or six methods just in a, in a really quick fashion here, but there's quite a few other cellular patterns for spore production, but I won't bore you with the details. The point is, as the hyphae are growing and the mycelium is expanding in this vegetative anamorphic growth form, some of the hyphae will produce little branching conidiophores, and these little branching conidiophores, which are studded all throughout the mycelium, they will produce spores. So they're kind of like a constantly active spore factory, always throwing out little spores to maximize the chances that the fungi can reproduce itself in as many places as possible. Both ascomycotes and abyssidiomycotes reproduce asexually in this anamorphic growth form. Some of these species are among the so-called imperfect fungi, as they never leave this anamorphic form. This is to say that they never really grow as anything more than asexually reproducing molds. That's what they are their whole life. They're always just this, this simple mold with its hyphae and its conidiophores asexually reproducing, and that's, that's all it does. However, both groups, both ascomycotes and basidiomycotes, also have a lot of species that move beyond the anamorphic growth form and into the teleomorphic growth form. I suppose now is a good time to briefly go over the typical life cycle of a fungi. I've just explored the basics of the anamorphic stage, and here the fungi grows like a mold. Its hyphae extends outwards, creeping along looking for food, and the whole time it's producing conidiophores that continually release spores for asexual reproduction. These spores are produced through meiosis of diploid parent cells, or by mitosis of haploid parent cells, and this makes the spores haploid. When the spores germinate to create new individuals, these new individuals will be haploid, with just a single copy of their chromosomes. Here's something really interesting. While these spores can produce a clonal haploid individual offspring, these haploid spores can also behave like gametes. They can come into contact with other haploid spores and fuse together to create a new individual through sexual replication. This gets really interesting when you look at the sexual compatibility of the haploid spores. For example, you might have seen a news headline about a slime mold or a fungi with hundreds or thousands of different sexes. 
This is not really analogous to the male and female sexes that exist in animals. Rather, in fungi, this is referring to a set of genes that are critical for sexual replication. There are lots of different sex genes for any given fungal species, but each individual only possesses a small handful of them. Each individual only has a small combination of sex genes, and the haploid spores can only reproduce sexually with other haploid spores who have a compatible combination of sex genes. This is the reality behind the eye-catching headlines about fungal species with hundreds or thousands of different sexes. Now, there may be many different combinations of sex genes, and thus many different mating types, but only two individuals can successfully reproduce at once. And during this sexual pairing, one fungal partner acts as the male, while the other acts as the female. This is with respect to the parent nuclei, where in some species of basidiomycotes, one parent fungi will keep their nuclei, and the other parent is said to donate their nuclei into the offspring hyphae. The one keeping their nuclei is called female, and the one donating their nuclei is called male. In some fungal species, they intentionally engage in sexual reproduction by producing structures that are explicitly gametes. In these cases, larger gametes are generally more immobile and more stable, and so they're called the female gametes because of their similarities to the eggs. Meanwhile, other gametes are smaller and much more mobile, much like the sperm, and so these are called male gametes. This male-female dichotomy allows for a degree of sexual selection. For example, multiple males compete with each other vigorously to mate with a single female. And in addition to this, the female has the potential to express a strong preference, or a choosiness, for one male nuclei over another. This choosiness is based on the same principles as the initial attraction of the potential fungal mate. You see, fungi don't have eyes or ears, so they can't really see or listen to a mate, and they don't have mouths to make noises to call for mates, but they do have the ability to secrete chemicals. And this is something that fungi do very well. They secrete pheromones, which are effective over short distances. These pheromones allow an individual mycelia, or an individual fungi, to detect and assess another individual in close proximity, to recognize its mating type. On the cellular scale, the pheromones describe the quality of the nuclei. Some nuclei with perceived poor quality can be rejected by the maternal fungi. Some pheromones are water-soluble, where they can be released and dissolve into the water by one fungi and then detected by another. So this is, this is a method to spread the pheromones around. Now the general trend is that mate choice typically goes to the individual or the gamete with the highest concentration of attractive pheromones. More pheromones simply induces a stronger preferential effect and directly increases mating success. When two compatible mating types meet in physical proximity, they can extend their hyphae and initiate the homing behavior that begins in anastomosis, or a conjoining of two different hyphae filaments. The anastomosis that forms literally fuses the parent fungi together. They literally co-create new cells in this symbiotic limb of hyphae, merging their membranes, and mixing their cytoplasm and all of their organelles together. This process of merging their cytoplasm and their membranes and all of their organelles is called plasmogamy. The membranes and the cytoplasm come together to compose the new cells, and they're filled with all of the shared organelles. But the compatible haploid genomes aren't combined analogously. They actually aren't joined together to make diploid cells. Not yet. Instead, they temporarily form dikaryotic cells, which are cells that possess two distinct haploid nuclei. So you have this anastomosis, you have these, this, this shared, co-created, symbiotic hyphae, and all of the, the plasma membrane, all of the cytoplasm, all of the organelles, they're all merging and mixing together. But the things that are not merging are the nuclei, and that's what keeps these, these new offspring cells dikaryotic. Because each nuclei 
one from each parent, is kept separate, they're genetically distinct from the other. And so at this point, they're called pronuclei, and this foreshadows their future merging. Now, in some species of basidiomycot fungi, this dikaryotic, prekaryogamy stage is characterized by structures called clamp connections. Within the very tip of the dikaryotic hyphae, cell replication is still happening, so the hyphae is still growing. Each time the cell at the tip replicates to extend the hyphae, it has to replicate both nuclei. Concurrent with this DNA replication is the emergence of a little protrusion coming out of the side of the hyphal cell, called a clamp connection. This protrusion begins to form an arc, or a hook structure, and as it forms and extends, it begins to suck up one of the four nuclei that now exist in the cell. So remember, you had two separate nuclei, and these nuclei are replicated, and so now there's four nuclei in the cell. And then this, this little hook structure begins to form, this clamp connection, and one of those four nuclei gets sucked up into the tube. As this nuclei moves down the growing tube, the, the one nuclei from the other pair will migrate to the rear end of the cell. A septum, or a, a wall, will form in the middle of the cell as the arcing tube grows overhead, which makes a physical connection between the two new cells. The clamp tube will reach into the new cell and deposit the nuclei that it was carrying. And now both cells, the original one and the one that just got created on the tip of the hyphae, now both of them each have one copy of each nuclei which preserves the dikaryotic nature of the hyphae as the cells replicate. In these species of basidiomycotes, this also creates long filaments of hyphae that are lined with these clamp connections. All the cells in their dikaryotic hyphae are linked with these little loops of cytoplasm and membrane, like a braid running through the cellular chain. Now, after some period of time, after some period of growth, these pronuclei go through a process called karyogamy, where the, where the nuclei eventually fuse together into a single diploid nuclei. Karyogamy begins when the pronuclei move together, in a step called pronuclear fusion, or pronuclear migration. Enzyme complexes of kinesin motor proteins and microtubules were constructed in mid or late plasmogamy, around each nucleus. And during this migration, these microtubules on each nuclei orient towards one another, and they work as a means for the nuclei to pull each other closer together. After pronuclear migration, the early steps of true karyogamy involve the nuclear double envelopes merging together, first the outer layer and then the inner layer. The spindle poles, these microtubule complexes, will also fuse together. The nuclei themselves will finally meet, and through stabilizing enzymatic reactions, they're able to be merged together and fused, in much the same way that chromosomes are swapped and merged in gene assortments during fertilization. At the end of the process, the replicating cells in the new hyphae are diploid, with a genome similar to, yet distinct, from the genomes of either parent. In a nutshell, this new diploid individual has diploid cells, and through meiosis, they'll produce haploid spores, and these will get released to land, germinate, and create more haploid mycelia, and the reproductive cycle begins all over again. The haploid spores produced by this diploid mycelia are grown in specific cellular structures, and this depends on the type of fungi. The spore-producing cellular structures are embedded into a relatively thick fungal tissue called a fruiting body. The fruiting body is the large, dense, macroscopic teleomorphic growth form of the fungi, which you might recognize as a mushroom, or a conch, or a puffball, or one of literally hundreds of other types. When I say that these fruiting bodies are large and dense, I mean that in relation to the individual hyphae and to the mycelia. So where a mold is a thin, soft carpet of hyphae, a fruiting body is much denser, much stiffer, and much more resistant to physical trauma. Now, they're still relatively soft, and they can be eaten by most organisms, but mold itself is pretty much totally defenseless from mechanical damage. The fruiting bodies are also macroscopic 
which means that you can see them with your naked eye, whereas individual hyphae are microscopic, and they can only sort of be seen with the naked eye when they group together to make rhizomorphs, or hair-like structures growing off the mold. The fruiting bodies are centralized, spore-producing superstructures created for the specific purpose of mass-releasing spores. Now, this is kind of a neat little evolutionary trick. If most basal fungi reproduce asexually, then they might suffer more from problems associated with repeated cloning. For example, mutations can accumulate in an asexual lineage, and this will eventually create unfit individuals. Furthermore, populations of clones are at risk of diseases and alterations to their environment, because the population lacks the variety in genotypes and phenotypes to survive these stressors. Because of this, being able to reproduce sexually is a very valuable thing, as it gives the population the opportunity to mix up some genes and create unique genetic combinations. Essentially, it creates genetic diversity, which promotes the health of not just the individual, but also the population as a whole. You can see the obvious evolutionary value here. The fungi saw the evolutionary value here too, as they would go on to evolve a diploid growth form, this, this fruiting body, that would produce a vibrant and massive explosion of spores with new genetic material. So where does this process of karyogamy typically occur? Which cells are affected? These are good questions, because it happens specifically in those specialized, spore-producing structures. I've mentioned two major groups of fungi, the ascomycotes and the basidiomycotes, and the titular difference between these two groups are the structures that they use to produce spores. The ascomycetes fungi have a reproductive structure called an ascus, which is kind of like a thin tube. The ascus experiences karyogamy, and its diploid cells then undergo meiosis to create eight haploid spores, called ascospores. In some species of ascomycotes, they'll produce two spores per ascus, or four, or a multiple of four, although eight spores per ascus is typically the most common. Now on the other hand, the basidiomycotes use a different structure for this, but the general idea is the same. Even the naming conventions are the same. So the basidiomycotes have reproductive structures called basidia, which are shaped like a club instead of a tube. The basidia goes through karyogamy to become diploid, and then it produces four haploid spores through meiosis, which are called basidiospores. Some species can produce two spores at once, others can produce eight spores, but four basidiospores seems to be the general norm. It's, it's what's most common. Now, the basidia and the asci are specifically grown in a layer of tissue called the hymenium. This tissue layer is typically external, where it lines the body of the sporocarp in such a way that the spores can be easily released into the external environment. For example, your typical agaric mushroom has gills on its underside. If you look at the underside of the cap, you'll see all of these little gills. These gills are lined with hymenium layers that produce and release spores into the air. In bolete mushrooms, Instead of gills, the hymenium lines the inside of tubes that run vertically down the interior of the sporocarp. So if you were to, if you were to look at the underside of a bolete mushroom, you would see a bunch of little holes, or pores, and these are the openings of long tubes that run through the mushroom cap. The inside of these tubes is lined with hymenium, and the hymenium is studded with all of the basidia, or the, the ascus cells, that produce the spores and release them into the air. The spores that are produced in these tubes are released, and they, they, they simply use gravity to just tumble right down out of the tubes. And once they're free of the parent fruiting body, the spores can be washed away in the rain, or blown away in the wind. In cap fungi, the hymenium is on the inner, concave surface of the sporocarp, where the spores can be blown out with wind, or scraped out by an animal. Most commonly, the cap fungi spread their spores through rain. Water droplets will fall into their cup, or bowl-shaped depressions, and the splash from these raindrops 
will propel a number of spores out of the hymenium tissue and into the nearby environment. In the puffballs and the stinkhorns, the hymenium is grown on an internal surface, integrated with other tissues so as to create a bubble, or a cavity, that's pressurized with air or fluid, and this cavity is designed to burst open. The force of this blasting open is enough to suction out or propel the spores, throwing them all over the place like shrapnel blasting out of a grenade. In parasitic fungi, the spores or the mycelia will invade a host, and they'll use the host's body as a staging ground for the production of the fruiting bodies. This is most infamously the case for Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, which is a fungus that invades the body of an ant, or some other insect, and turns it into a zombie. The fungi breaks through the insect's exoskeleton to reach the soft tissue inside, where it then begins to chemically take over its body, to hijack the body from the control of the little insect's mind. The insect's mind, or its consciousness, if you will, basically becomes a prisoner in its own body. The first behavioral modifications that the fungi induces in the insect include irregular spasms that are intended to destabilize the insect. So if, if the bug is crawling on a branch or on a plant, the fungi wants the bug on the forest floor, so it'll induce these muscular spasms to make it lose its balance or lose its grip and fall off. Now once the bug has been dropped onto the forest floor, the fungus will exert more control and induce the insect to find a new vascular plant and to crawl up its stem and out onto a leaf. Here, the bug will then bite extremely hard on the central leaf vein so as to position its body in the right spot to produce the fruiting body. Now this spot is oddly specific. The fungi will aim for areas on the plant about 22 to 28 centimeters above the ground, where it's very humid and generally warm, around 20 to 30 degrees Celsius. And now, after the insect has been positioned about a quarter meter above the ground, the fungi will kill the insect, and begins to earnestly consume its soft flesh for nutrients. Hyphae will grow to reinforce the insect's exoskeleton, as a kind of protective shell, and in the course of four to ten days, the fruiting body will break out of the insect's head. The fruiting body comes out like a long, stiff tentacle, grasping and growing in the air. These tentacle structures contain hymenium tissue, which produces more spores that can then be released to potentially infect more insects. The fruiting bodies look different depending on the species or subspecies of Orpheocordyceps. Some of them are white shafts with spherical red caps. Others remain shaped like tentacles, which grow brown or white or tan or yellow as they come snaking out of the insect's body, and others still grow like clubs or flasks. This wide variety isn't limited to just Ophiocordyceps. There's a huge morphological diversity among fungal fruiting bodies. Some are brightly colored, while others are dark or dull. Some are simple globular shapes, or typical agaric shapes, while others have an exotic, alien-like appearance that can hardly be described. Epigeous sporocarps grow on the ground and they reach up into the air, while hypogeous sporocarps grow down, deep into the ground. Furthermore, fungi are hugely diverse in their chemical properties. Some of these fruiting bodies are safe to eat, and they taste delicious and some are safe to eat, but they taste disgusting, while some are not safe to eat. They are dangerously poisonous and can even kill a human. Now, other mushrooms don't taste very good, but they are edible, and they are poisonous, but not so much as to be deadly. They're just poisonous enough to be consciousness altering, and these mushrooms, that when you eat them and they alter your consciousness, that experience is often described as spiritual. This wide morphological and biochemical diversity are a testament to the ancient lineage of fungi, which has experienced more than a billion years of evolution. Alright, well, 
that's about it for this episode. Hit that like button, share this episode with a friend, and if you like what you hear, then subscribe to the channel to get more episodes right when I drop them. And as always, thanks for listening. Thank <laughs> you.